brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Badminton Podcast, proudly brought to you by Volantware, the brand giving you the most versatile badminton apparel. Both the podcast and the brand are here because we love badminton and we're here building the badminton community and helping you to grow both as a player and as a person, while also trying to make badminton look a bit nicer on court and off as well. Today, we're here at the Malaysian Masters 2020 with another really awesome guest. And I'll let Gronya Somerville, who is our replacement for Henry because he's not here at the moment in Malaysia, but she's going to be my co-host again on this podcast. Hi guys, so today we're here with Ruud Boss from the Netherlands. He is a former Dutch national player. He has seven national titles to his name, European team silver medalist, um, an international tournament winner. He was the head coach of Extreme for the um, Extreme team in Taiwan for two years and the Dutch national junior head coach for 2.5 years and is now um, been with the Dutch national senior team for one year and takes care of the elite players leading into Tokyo 2020, mainly focusing um, on the doubles category. We as Europeans think of the Asian way of playing and then also within training is that it's a lot of speed and power. Shuttle exchange is going really hard and really fast and sometimes the quality of the shot is not that good. But mainly what the difference is, it's sometimes not that smart where in Europe we are trying to be as efficient as we can and then also uh, tactical wise so we try to outsmart them on court coaches will do almost everything for their players but when it comes to badminton anything other than that they need to do themselves more or less do themselves so um thanks for being on the podcast today no problem it's a um, pretty impressive resume, don't you think, Rania? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, tell us a bit about your badminton journey, how you got started. and. Um, I think I started when I was five years old. Um, my father was playing badminton just for fun, and my brother was doing more or less the same. And there was a long waiting list for the club that I wanted to join, or their club. My brother actually wanted to quit, and so we swapped names, and I could just come in and oh, really? <laughs> yeah, skip the line a little bit. Wait, um, was he as tall as you? Uh, no, a little bit smaller, but at that point, yeah, he's one and a half years older, so probably we're pretty much the same height. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just uh, did what is quite normal in the Netherlands. You just start practicing once a week in a club. Uh, there's club training. There's not really like personal training or anything like that. And so on, you start to play league. There's quite a good uh, league in the Netherlands, that's the whole structure for that. And uh, just started to build that up. I think I was around the age of 12, I came into a regional team quite late, actually. I came into the national team when I was 15 years old as a non-singles player, because everybody just comes in as average single doubles mix. They didn't see that in me. They just saw it directly. Okay, you're more like a double player. So focus on that. I took that chance and um, long story short, I went up to um, all the national teams that we had in juniors leading up to the senior team, trying to qualify for the Olympics in uh, London. Missed that, missed out on that for one place. So first reserve. Mm. Yeah. Um, and after that, got into coaching. At that point, sponsor uh, Extreme. Extreme. Yeah. So you've had a bit of history in Europe as well as in Asia then? Yes, for sure. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, definitely. And just for everyone listening, I met, I first met you, Rude, in 2007, I believe. It's a long time ago. 2007. Yes. So that's 13 years ago. Now it's yeah. 2020. So 13 years ago, I was over there training with the national team for a few weeks, I think it was, and yeah. I actually stayed with Rude's parents yeah. at their bed and breakfast. Is it B&B? Bed yeah, and breakfast it was at that point at B&B, but yeah, and generally it was just a really big house with a lot of rooms and... Uh, we hosted a lot of uh, international players that wanted to come and train with the national team, uh, and so did you. Yeah. 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 So that was the time when I personally was going for the 2008 Beijing Olympics, 
and I just missed out also. So I know exactly how that feels. So my condolences, but we're, <laughs> no, we're here today. We're, we're still in it. We're still in it. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, you used to play, who did you used to play with? Uh, I played very in the beginning. I played the, with Jurgen Wouters, but that was really in the beginning. But after that, uh, my, my best results were with, were with uh, Kun Ritter. Kun Ritter, yeah. And at that time, there was also Eric Pang, yeah. Diggy Pauliyama. Yeah, singles. And um, Judith. I can't pronounce her surname. Sorry, Judith. <laughs> Merlin Dax. Okay. Yeah, I, that's why I can't say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, uh, Mia Odina was still there when I just started as a yeah, new senior player. Um, Yao Ji. We had Brenda Bainhager was like this, this whole team was uh, amazing in especially women's singles. Yeah. And they also could play women's doubles. So they eventually became second in the world, I think, at the Euro Cup. Uh, okay. In the group stage, almost beating China. Yeah, yeah, sure. And out of all the places in Europe, you ha how many places have you actually trained in? Um, outside of uh, Netherlands, I practice a lot in Germany with the German team as well. But uh, in Asia, it was uh, Malaysia uh, mainly. Yeah, Indonesia, yeah. we did as well. So um, yeah, I think uh, two of uh, the top countries in, in badminton. So yeah, it, it was a nice experience. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So would you have been one of the tallest badminton players in the history of the sport, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but there are a few uh, that are taller than I am. Who's taller than you? For sure, Colding, Mats Colding. Yes. He's uh, taller than I am. Um, I think I'm quite equal with Ivanov. Ivanov, yeah. But he looks bigger because he, looks, he is he's just twice bigger. my size. Yeah, in, in strength. Strength, yeah, in width. <laughs> in width. In yeah, girth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you had the uh, Hong Wei, the men's level. Uh, oh, yeah, China. yeah, yeah. He, I think he was a little bit taller than I was. So, how tall are you? Uh, 198, so that's uh, six, 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 seven. So, almost, almost two meters tall. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, this is no wonder why people couldn't hit past you in the front court. Yeah, well, that, how many times did Kuhn hit you in the back of the head when he's smashing? Um, <laughs> Is it a common thing? Many times actually, but um, yeah, only when it's a real miss hit, but not when he tries to hit it really because I was just making way for him. Yeah, you're <laughs> so, ducking. You're, duck. you're on your hands and knees ducking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the only times that he hit me was more that the shot that just went over me, over my back, and then yeah. he just had to yeah. do it like that. like Underarm, under yeah, arm. yeah. So, mm. uh, yeah, no, not many times, luckily. Yeah. <laughs> So in terms of the Dutch league, yeah. I don't know much about the Dutch league. Is it similar to the Danish league and the French league? Um, it's of course it's similar. The whole structure is similar. Uh, the setup in matches are is a little bit different. Um, we have um, eight teams in the highest league. Uh, no, ten teams. Sorry, ten teams in the highest league. Eight matches per uh, league match, uh, which means two men singles, two ladies singles, men doubles, ladies doubles, and two mixed doubles. So two of everything. Yep. Yeah. But other than that, it's Similar, uh, we are still holding on to three sets, uh, best of three to 21. Yep. Where in the other uh, leagues, they are making it shorter. What are they uh, doing? Till, they? till 11, I think. The like. third set to 11? No, it? it's uh, five sets, I think. Oh, five sets. Uh, Germany, each uh, league is kind of different. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, the, the whole structure is uh, pretty much similar, only the, 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 the level. Of course, in Denmark is way higher. They, they have top players, even like the. The, the whole uh, group underneath it is still better than the top Dutch league players that are normally in there. So okay. a lot of national team players are not in the league. They just do that for extra. So they are in Denmark, they are in Germany, uh, okay, some of them sure. are French. Yeah. Yeah. Does the Dutch league have like international players participate? They do. They do. They, um, because of Denmark now also have the rule that you're allowed to play in two different leagues. Uh, we have a few Danish players that like is that group underneath uh, young players that are from the national team or just underneath the national team. They're in there. We have a few um, Eastern European players, but they are um, more or less in the Netherlands studying or something like that. Mm. So it's a nice combination actually for um, younger players from national team, a little bit older players. For example, Kuhn, my former partner, he is still playing, but that's more on his experience, not on his, not his uh, physical, <laughs> physical ability. No. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. 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 And yeah. is the system in Netherlands that you come through the club system and so that's very important to the league having the, the big yeah. clubs and that kind of thing? Yeah, even though the, the clubs are not that big because uh, as any other sports these days, Amazon is struggling with the amount of members and also the, the young talents. But we're trying to, as a federation, we're trying to change the whole structure in how we build up 
from scratch, like when they start until maybe national team to get better talent uh, earlier within our own uh, hands. Yeah. 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 I think that's something that look, the European countries do really well. And especially in Australia and say New Zealand and that part of the world, we don't have that infrastructure of the leads and the clubs and everything like that. And I think it really affects our ability to produce an, a good number of really high level players. How do you feel that, I'm not sure if you have the answer for this, but how do you feel that, say, a, a country like Australia, who, look, the participation rate is definitely increasing, because especially because we also do have a lot of immigration as well, mm -hmm. but how would you build a league system that basically brings up the players like you do? It's such, it sounds like such a good pathway, yeah. whereas in the less developed countries, the pathway kind of ends, and then there's gaps between the pathway, and a lot of players fall out, and they stop playing. But in Europe, it seems like there's a lot more infrastructure to help them to play in different leagues. And I guess it's easier because the countries are so close. Exactly. So you can play French league, play Danish league, you can play Dutch league. Yeah, what exactly. other leagues are there other than those? Uh, Swiss is still there, uh, Germany. Okay. Um, and of course, we had also in England, they had at some point similar to what uh, India has now with the PDL. But that stopped, unfortunately. But it, that's more like a cup kind of thing. So, yeah. uh, so not a one-off thing. Yeah. It's more like those countries are the top countries when it comes to league. Austria, they also have their own league. Um, I, I assume that Italy and Spain, they have it as well. But because of a few countries, uh, maybe similar to Germany and, and France, they're quite big. And uh, in Spain and Italy, it's similar. But badminton is just not a big sport. So they have just a few clubs that have a few top players. And then they add some international players uh, mm. to that. Um, there is a European Cup, so uh, most of the winners, champions of their uh, national league, they will come and fight for the Euro European Cup. Yep. So there is a system that uh, it is d different in, in many ways, but which is similar is everybody starts young in a club and then you're attached to this club. You have once or twice a week training as a club training and yeah, um, it, it builds like a, a family kind of thing. So you will stay in it. Um, and then for from really young age, you already have the league on a junior level. And of course, because of the countries are small as well, or when the bigger countries, they have more clubs in the region, you have a league quite close mm. to each other. So you're capable of playing a lot of matches. Yeah. Because you can just travel, there's so many, it's so close that you can just get there. Yeah. Whereas compared to say Australia or the USA, if they were going to have a league, yeah. how would they physically get exactly. people to, exactly. to travel so far? It, it's possible, but then you need to go like in every single village that is close by, you need to have a badminton club or something like that. But badminton is just not that big in uh, the US. Uh, Australia. Australia is yeah. similar. And I think uh, in Australia, the, the whole structure is differently. If well, you need to tell me that, but yeah. in my eyes, it's more that there is a badminton hall and you can go there and you can get training. Yeah. And if you want to become more better, then you need to you have the coaching. personal yeah, coaching. Yeah, yeah, personal coaching. Personal yeah. coaching. And there's, there's not really that club environment. There are definitely clubs, but and there are sessions that they run, mm -hmm. but it doesn't become... What it sounds like from your perspective is like it becomes like a family. Like you're you're in the club and you're probably always going to be representing that club no matter where you go. Mm, a, a little bit, then, unless you become better, of course, because there are just a few clubs there. Are, as I said, in the, in the highest league, there are only 10 clubs and those are the main clubs in the Netherlands. And of course, around it are smaller clubs. And from those smaller clubs, they will go to the main clubs. The other thing is, which is, I think, very important for that all those players are practicing together is that we are in the Netherlands, we only have three uh, specific badminton holes. Any other club is on government holes, which is yeah. together with basketball, volleyball, well, you name it. Um, so there are certain times when you can go for practice. So you're more or less, uh, you have to go then because there's no other time. Mm. So that will make people practice with each other instead of all different Separate, yeah. uh, individual mm. groups. So I think that helps as well. Mm. So what would you think is most important for a developing country? <laughs> Did you have an answer for that? <laughs> um, no, of course not, because I, I, I'm not 100%. I'm sure this... I don't have the knowledge of how it exactly works. Uh, but as I said, I think what is most important is that you get a lot of 
a similar minded people together and practice with each other instead of individual. And then the league, I think it is very important to also let them on an early age get in touch with uh, competing, uh, losing, winning, stuff like that. Um, it brings up a certain kind of character in people. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have that character, okay, I don't want to lose, they will probably train. go further and train and become better. What else? Yeah, everything stands or falls with, um, well, one thing that nobody wants actually to talk about is money. But yes. on the other hand, it's a structure in uh, coaching development as well. If as coaches, we talk the same language, we will have all players more or less on a similar level, or at least when they go to a national team or a region team, something like that, if that is the case, we don't have to fix a lot of stuff. Yeah. Because it's taught properly already. Yes. Yeah. So you can build on, add on what they already know instead of you have to go back again and fix everything until they get the proper way of playing. What if there is a proper way of playing? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to say exactly. Okay, this is this is what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. So multi multifaceted. Is there is there a, 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 like a what I just said a, a regional team thing and then you go to maybe a, an, an elite from the regional and then you go to the national team or is it more or less out of the clubs? You It's more more or less out of the clubs. Yeah. So out of the clubs, then there, was, there are certain tournaments or competitions that will be a state level competition. Yeah. And then say state teams will be selected for a national competition, but it's not, it's only a w once a year. So the national competition is once a year, yeah. but the state teams don't usually come together to train or do anything except yeah. for that tournament. Yeah. So it's not, it's a little bit disjointed. And, and, and that's why you have all these separate groups, which cannot uh, use each other to become better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's a shame. It is a shame. But of course, uh, Australia, it's, it's a totally different situation in Europe, of course. Uh, yeah. And we can go to any other country and still be closer by than you guys will be to <laughs> The other yeah, side to of the outside country. of the country. Yeah. 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 Okay. So moving on from the issues in the less developed countries <laughs> and you trying to fix those solution, those things yeah. to it and give solutions for it. When did you stop playing competitively with Kuhn? Um, 2014. 2014. So after London, uh, we separated for a little while. I started playing with a, a young um, Dutch guy and he started playing with just uh, international players. Um, eventually 2013, we said, okay, let's come back together and practice. But then we got from our NLC, no budget anymore. And they had to make decisions. And that the decision was that Kuhn had to go out. I was allowed to stay for more or less mixed doubles. The other thing was that me and Kuhn, we made name internationally and we could find a sponsor for ourselves so we could provide for ourselves. The other thing was that if I stayed in the national team, I had to pay a hundred euros, which from my time before that was totally weird. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah. it's it's normal. so normal. And I cannot complain because other countries have to pay for so much more than I yeah. did. But uh, I didn't have that. And of course, I my whole structure um, for a living was built on the money that I got from the club and uh, some prize money, sponsor money but it didn't include that 100 euro extra per month. And I had to wear Yonex 100% because that the, the national team was sponsored by Yonex. Yes. Quite fast after that, that whole contract was canceled, but you know, you, was not sh you were not sure about your income. So I chose to step out of the national team. We tried to um, practice on our own and we did that as well. We got a new sponsor, uh, Xtreme from Taiwan. Um, they supported us financially and also uh, when we were close by, then we could come and practice with them, uh, which was really good. But then 2014, um, uh, we had a training camp in Taiwan and our results were so bad that eventually I just said, okay, this, there's no, uh, we're not growing anymore. Yeah. And also our results are so bad. My bank account says, yes. if you can not change quickly, then you're pretty much on zero. So I made a decision to stop. And I got the question from the boss of Extreme, what are you going to do? I said, I have no idea. And then he offered me a, a, a playing coach job coach, yeah. uh, for Extreme team in Taiwan for two years. For two years. Yeah. So were you, so you were taking the training, so you were coaching, 
but you were also doing the training, you were training yourself as well during yeah. that two years? Yeah, so what I did was uh, the first four months I was more or less as an assistant coach. There was a head coach uh, for which was more uh, into singles. So I took the doubles boys and those boys were, some were still just last year juniors and uh, the other ones were just outside of uh, juniors, but they were all uh, winners of world junior medals. Wow. So I had really talented players. And so I made the, the practice for the double players and then I practiced with them as well. Four months uh, into the job, uh, head coach was fired and I became head coach. I requested another Taiwanese coach for just for the language barrier because yes. a few of them were understanding me quite well. They could also speak some English, but there were also a few that had no idea what I was talking about. Um, so sometimes like also that culture change, the gap was so big that I actually wanted somebody, but didn't get any. Yeah. So um, um, yeah, more or less for one and a half year, I was head coach of that Taiwanese team. And uh, I played myself as well. So I made the practice and I joined them as well. Yeah. 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 And how much Chinese were you able to speak? So if someone talks to you purely about badminton and how to play badminton and coaching, <laughs> in, Chinese. Can you, in Chinese, can you speak a lot more than in everyday things? Because uh, you know... No. No, no, it's, uh, it was way too hard. And um, in the beginning, as many people, I think, when they go to a country where they don't speak the language, um, they are in their minds, okay, I'm gonna try to learn it and stuff like that. But the first half year, we were, I think I was there for everything combined for just a month, because other, we were traveling so much to tournaments and stuff like that. So uh, there was no time. And then also my boss, he wanted me to speak English to them because he w actually was hoping that eventually those players that were uh, a bit extreme were uh, going into his business and then go overseas uh, and, and help with help. the business. So they needed to learn English, English a little bit more. Yeah. So it was, uh, he made it comfortable for me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame. Okay. Yeah. I could speak small things. Small things. <laughs> like Grania. Yeah. Oh, Grania can speak a bit. Uh, Grania can do way can do more. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If not, something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a Chinese challenge off. No. No, 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 no. no. okay. <laughs> so that seems like quite a lot to balance then. Like you start to coach the singles as well as doubles, as well as training yourself and coaching and then the whole cultural difference of... Yeah that as well was that a lot to handle at once or um yeah in the beginning it was a little bit frightening uh, because I, I didn't do that much coaching before i stopped so i, I wasn't a dutch club but that was quite easy because you speak the language yeah. and it's club level so it's not like that you need to go into detail per person that much you do like one general training but now you have to go specific and on the highest level and for doubles that was quite easy or for singles i really struggled that's why i also requested another coach for more mainly for singles um i i did my best and unfortunately i lost my single players more fast than i actually hoped um yeah. on one side my boss he was just expecting results from the players and on the other side the players were also struggling with the whole uh, coaching thing so I'm not afraid to say that my single coaching is a little bit, well, way worse on international level than my double coaching. Mm, yeah. But that's, it, it was a lot to take in, but it was eventually fine. And, uh, yeah, I worked myself uh, into it, but um, it's a lot to take, especially the, the whole cultural thing. I had to get used to the people that were in the training center. And there was also the, the, the main office for extreme uh, as a, as the company. People are coming in and out, uh, asking for stuff that the players need to, uh, to tell them or they needed something from them or from me during training. And that whole thing, like there's a hierarchy that people from the office are above the whole group. Huh. It was- uh, So something. you have to stop training and talk to them kind of thing. Well, they more or less come in and in the beginning they had to get used to that I'm the coach. So they have to ask me if they can come in, uh, which before they didn't have to, because that is the whole Taiwanese yeah. culture, um, they are above, so they don't have to ask the coach to. So come. you just broke that. You just said uh, this more is less my training. Ask. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a lot of stuff I think in in that culture that as a Western person you seriously don't understand in the beginning. Yeah, even that practice is, has been cancelled because they need to help unpack a container with products, with products to put it products, into yeah. the uh, store, the store or something like that. It's like 
Okay, that's not gonna happen. Come on, uh, they have a lot of time beside that. If you wanna have uh, need them, or if you wanna help, uh, have their help, then do it outside. After training, yeah. Uh, outside of training times. Yeah. And even then, I told them like they need their rest as well. So get Find some more, get, get, yeah. get some more people in, and yeah. <laughs> give them a job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. In terms of like on court training, from I've obviously trained in like Asian and Eastern. Uh, yeah, European kind of style as well. How did you find bringing your European experience of training and coaching to them and how did they kind of take it and was it a bit of a hard process um, getting um, them used to it? There's a big difference. What we as Europeans think of the Asian way of playing and then also within training is that it's a lot of speed and power. Shuttle exchanges going really hard and really fast and Sometimes the, the quality of the shot is not that good, but mainly what the difference is, it's sometimes not that smart. So what I did was bringing my experience in tactics um, over to the boys. And because we were playing so many tournaments, directly they saw the result. So it was actually quite good to take in. The only thing I had a problem with, I had uh, a few really tall boys similar to me or well, my height is a little bit more extreme, yeah. but they were quite tall. And I had one really small guy and he... Was that Ninja? Yeah, Ninja. Yeah. <laughs> ninja. <laughs> ninja. Yeah, um, yeah he, he sometimes could not handle the things that I did because of my height. And that, for me, it was sometimes also difficult to place myself into him because he's, what, maybe 160 mm. if he's lucky. Oh, yeah. So. Um, in that case, for him, I had to think differently and I had to use his skills uh, a little bit on a different way. But yeah, uh, the, the whole tactical thing and change their game so they become more smart in playing and use their skills on a, in a better way um, actually turned out quite well. Mm. Um, so because they saw the improvements, they trusted you yeah, like, yeah. a bit quicker. On the other hand, they just had to because this is the cultural thing. Yeah. They're used to just when somebody's above you, you just listen, listen. and you do whatever you mm. be, you're being told. Yeah. And I try to change that a little bit as well. Yeah, like yeah. ask them what they, what they wanted need. to. Yeah. Exactly. In the beginning, there was a big thing that I had to more or less answer my own questions all the time because they were not used to answer on their own thoughts. Mm. So I slowly implemented questions and stuff like that. Okay, just and also told them straight up like. If you think differently, if you're not, if you don't agree, tell me, we can have a discussion about it because mm. I want to hear your opinion because I also wanted to learn from them to get my experience uh, on a higher level. So, but that, that took a little while, especially the boys that were not that good in English that took mm. longer, but, um, yeah, eventually they, via other persons that could speak English, they, they got their questions yeah, in as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Have exactly. had any issues about like um, the length of training drills or training times? Because I know a lot of Asians that I know that train in Europe, they're like, oh, the drills are so short. I feel like I don't train at all. Like it's just like one hour and a half and then I'm done. And then the Europeans, they'll go to Asia and they're like, oh, we just trained for like three, three hours. hours. But I feel like there was no quality. There were just a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I changed my way of thinking a little bit. So I adapted more to their side. So when it was a physical training, I did what they normally did. So longer time, longer amount of shuttles in when it comes to multi shuttles and stuff like that. So they're still used to the hard, fast practice that they normally have. Um, when it comes to technical practice and technique practice, I took shorter times as in what we do in Europe. So the luck that I more or less had because of those talented boys, the quality in the shots were a lot of times uh, still good, good enough. It was not that it was such a big difference. Yeah. So I could do exercises, um, technical, technical exercises for a little bit longer time than I normally would do in Europe. So yeah, there is a big difference, but I adapted a little bit more to them and then slowly changed a little bit. So it mm. comes closer to like the gap between the two uh, uh, continents as in practice uh, became closer, smaller. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So just for the audience who may not be aware about what the actual differences are between the European style and the Asian style. Do you think you could run down and be a bit specific about what it actually is? So you're talking about multi-shuttles. So for example, in Asian culture, what would you say the number of shuttles that would be compared to European? So just so that people listening who don't have a, a good idea have yeah. 
you can, they can actually see the differences between them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when it comes to multi shuttle, then I think you almost have to think as in terms for, let's say, like a left, like forehand and backhand um, side uh, jump smash, so left to right, uh, back and forth, um, they would do 25. When I do it in Europe, then when it's a really, really heavy week, I would do maximum 20. But other than that, I'll do 16 in a row. So you take 10 off or sometimes half off. So that is a little bit the amount. So we are more on um, two third of their number. Yeah. Yeah. And then in time of of exercises without the multi shot, so ongoing exercises, uh, yeah, we do one and a half minute to maximum two and a half minutes. When it's an exercise, when it comes to sparring exercise, I'll go five minutes. But they would just go 15 minutes, 20 yeah. minutes. Even whole so. session. Yeah, whole <laughs> session. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's ridiculous. But yeah, but they, on the other hand, the climate helps them to also take a rest in between exercises. So they would do 20 minutes exercise and they have a five minute break. If we do that in an analysis, you will just have to start over your, your warm up again almost. Oh, because so, you would just get cold too quickly. Get, yeah. yeah. So it, it, the climate more or less gives you the time to have longer sessions, as in three hours, three and a half hours, where in the Netherlands we do it everything within two hours, sometimes even shorter, because the breaks in between are a little bit shorter. Mm. Yeah. 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 So what about, so you were talking about the multi shot of so jump smashing, so 25 compared to 16, for example. Yeah. What about the physical session? So if you do a physical long multi shuttle session, like where you're just feeding the shuttles, maybe 60 shuttles, 80 shuttles, yeah. like what is it in Asia for that? And what is it in Europe for that? Um, I think what we, I have done uh, as a maximum in a row was 120. So just kept on, keep on 120. running. 120, so in where, which, was that in that Taiwan? Was, no, that was in the Netherlands. That was okay. like uh, in the most, one of the most heaviest weeks. And it was in a period there were no tournaments, so a building up. Um, in Taiwan, you can just easily go uh, 80, that's normal. And uh, when you go want to go higher, you can go to 160. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. will more or less die on court as well. <laughs> yeah. But they are used to it. And that is also the cultural thing. They just do because their discipline is, I listen to the coach. He will provide me with whatever what I, need. I need and I'll do it. So yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it, there's a big difference, but that's at some point, in my eyes, I, I took it down because I didn't see the, the value of it. Yeah. So I, I made that kind of things more equal to Europeans. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the physical condition then, so if let's just say the Asian countries are doing more jump smashes, more multi shuttle, they're doing things for longer, then you would think that their endurance and their ability to stay on the court and sustain a high level of intensity that would to be longer and easier for them to maintain. How do you compensate for that from a European level? Because of course you have to compete in that way. You might yeah. compete a bit differently tactically, not play as fast, not hit as hard, be a little bit more tactical, but how do you make, yeah, how do you basically make up for maybe some lack of physical strength and power and endurance to be able to compete with them from the European point of view? Well, that's, that's the whole thing where in Europe we are trying to be as efficient as we can and then also uh, tactical wise. So we try to outsmart them on court. So we are trying to build up our speed uh, shuttle wise. So the, the racket skills and stuff like that, we can compete with them when it comes to the flat game or uh, from up down from the net in defense. But other than that, actually in the first three, four shots, we try to outsmart them and then be on top of the, uh, the rally. So everything that we do in practice, in, in Europe is more, um, there's a background with people that are, have studied for that and you do everything as so efficient as possible. Where in Asia, you go like, okay, we have a thousand persons. This is the most hard uh, training, training schedule. <laughs> Somebody will be left over. So it's inefficient but they will do it and eventually somebody will end up on be top. Able, yeah, they'll be able to do it, handle yeah. it, and then they'll be the top one. Yeah, and yeah. then because of that, they have so many people that compete with each other, they will push each other up to a higher level. Plus, there will be one player that has everything combined. Let's say a Linden. He has, he's technical smart, he is uh, technical, technical yeah. really good. He has stamina. Yeah, uh, physical, so yeah, power. Everything. Yeah, yeah. So there will be always one. And that's the whole difference in Europe. We don't have always, there will always be, will always be one. one. So yeah. we need to be efficient and um, yeah, there has to be a lot of thought behind it. 
up yeah. front. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you went across from, again, like Taiwan back to the Netherlands coaching, was it another transition in the, the way that you coached as well? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, of course, um, I couldn't just tell everybody, okay, you have to do it like this. But on the other hand, we uh, came back into funding again um, after Rio. So we were allowed to have a junior team that practice every day at the Olympic Training Center. Um, and I became their coach. So they had to learn more or less what it is to become a, a professional player. So in that case, the gap was not that big. So I had to tell them or teach them more or less everything. I could just tell them, okay, you have to do it like this because they had no idea. Um, so the transition was not that big. And then you needed to put, um, and now I'm going to lose my words because I, I feel you're feeling into it. You have to talk to them. They will talk back to you. It's a new generation that asks questions, questions. freaking <laughs> for everything. So, um, but you also, they are, you need to understand that they go away from their uh, parental house. They, they go away from their parents. They're their safe environment. They go outside there they're going to live on their own. There are people um, taking care of them, but they don't trust them yet. So you are more or less their second Parents. parent. Hmm. So you need to give that back. So as a coach on court, I'll be quite strict as in Taiwan. Yeah. And as a person uh, outside of court, you need to really, you know, try to see and feel what is going on, how are they feeling, stuff like that. So extra hours next to court were really a big thing. Uh, I made so many hours that I actually didn't have to make, but I had to because, uh, or my feeling said I had to because otherwise uh, they will drop out again. Yeah. yeah. Do you find in the Asian culture and Asian coaching, is there much of that outside court stuff for the players? Or is it more um, just come to training, we tell you what to do, do it, and then you go home and there's nothing else outside of that, like outside in their um, lives? Not, yeah, well, yes and no. Um, the thing is the, the whole trust thing in Asia, so players trust the coach completely, that also builds up some kind of relationship. Yeah. They will not step away from that coach almost forever. So they will always stick with that coach. They will always be very, um loyal loyal Loyal. yeah for sure um in the netherlands it is or in europe it's more or less yes i trust my coach or i need to trust my coach i will ask them for everything but when i'm changing to a different group that coach still there and i'm i'm grateful for it but it's that person is not that important anymore and the thing outside in in asia is not as in we need to think about are you doing well in school or anything else coaches will do almost everything for their players but when it comes to badminton anything other than that they need to do themselves more or less do themselves Mm. that's how i see it and in the netherlands we have a little bit more of that yeah you have a social career after your badminton it's not that that it's this is permanent it's not football or as in europe yeah soccer um that you can just retire after you're done so you need to have a little bit more and grow as a person as well so yeah. you can just go back into society back into society back into the real world <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well because <laughs> top sport is not the real world yeah. yeah so more of a holistic approach for that so from a general kind of view i feel that a lot of the asian countries will produce they can produce really high level players much younger at much younger ages yes. than europeans do you, what do you think i've got my theory as to why i think that is but what do you think about that like so why do you see that happening do you think it's related to the training um i think it's related to the training on a younger age the amount of time that they're training on court um, yeah and also the quality of the coaches so when I was in Taiwan, I went to a lot of uh, high school tournaments, university tournaments, and even in the lower schools, there is like a full-time job for a badminton coach. So there are certain schools that have a full-time badminton coach as a as a PA, PE PA, yeah. uh, teacher. So it starts there. And after school, they have three, four hour training sessions. So they are done at three o'clock and then they have training sessions in school. And I think that's the big difference. Every single day when they are the age of seven, eight years old, they they're have, playing. They're playing. And the level of the coach is quite high because they are getting paid full time as a teacher. So I think that is the, the biggest 
difference and also the amount of players. Yeah, the amount. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah definitely agree with the actually I agree with everything, but I didn't think about the coaches part of it. Yeah. That's a new perspective for me. Yeah, because it's it's a lot of like um, I think that two or three of my former players within Extreme, one of them has a coaching um, a job now in a in a school. And he is highly talented, so he will give his experience. I'm not 100% sure if he got some kind of degree, but they will give their experience through to the younger players. They are yeah. technical, uh, gifted, they are physical, they know exactly what they do because they're just copying their thing, what they had to do as a player on the younger yeah, players. And it works for them, that. yeah. 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 So, um, well, I like went how you said that when there's a thousand players, then you get that one coming through. I mean, all those thousand players still get to a high level as well. And then if you think about it, a lot of them will go into the coaching scene. So yeah, then, yeah. then there's like, what, 150 good coaches out there, which yeah, exactly. is very different from again, the Netherlands where there's just those few ones that come through and then yeah. and maybe then, not even they all choose to stay in badminton afterwards as well. Yeah, and in the Netherlands, it's not very common that there is a full-time job as a coach. So yeah. only in a national team, and maybe we have now one uh, extra academy that more or less made his job out of badminton. Um, is doing his full time. Other coaches is just club coaches that are, as I said, two, three times a week and they get, it's it's next to their normal job. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And then for my, in terms of my theory as to why that happens, I completely agree about the amount of playing time on court and how, they, how many hours they do. My thought also was why they're so good at tournaments so early. So what I found personally is that the Asian players tend to adapt to conditions very, very well yep. and pressure. And I, I think pressure and everything like that and tournament performance. And for me, I was, it's, it's kind of about badminton age, not not chronological age, so not actually yeah. physical age. So if you talk about the amount of hours that they played or the amount of, I think there's so many tournaments and competitions at such a young age yes. for them definitely. compared to Australia, definitely, but Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And so when they're 13 years old, their badminton age is, say, a European's maybe 20 year old yeah. because they've already played that many tournaments, they've been on court that much. Yeah. So then, once, once the Europeans actually get to the enough, like a high enough badminton age, then that's later in their career. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely true. There are so many. Uh um, tournaments, small tournaments, but also the the, the, the club the club competitions. Yeah. competitions. It's 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 always there. So so many players on a high level competing against each other, the level just goes up. And on an early age, if you ha already have that, then yeah, for sure, your your badminton age is compared to the Western countries uh, much higher. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think we see that a lot, say in the world junior level. So world junior level, there are definitely some Europeans that do very well, yeah. but generally speaking, I'd say it's mainly dominated by the Asian countries. Yes. And that may be just because of badminton age, not physical age. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, true. So what do you think then about like a lot of the Asians that, you know, peak a lot very well in um, juniors and then kind of as the Europeans get their, you know, get up to that badminton age, then it starts to even out a bit more and some of the Asian players don't actually pr like improve that much from then on. Do you think that's part of that kind of quality thing that you're talking about in the training and like the tactical development? Yeah. Or what do you think about um, that crossover? Yeah, I, th I think, and I hope that I'm, I'm right on this, it's that as Europeans, we try to find the sol solutions a lot, not just in badminton or in, in sports, but in general, we try to find the solutions for to become better again. And I think as as players, we are a little bit more ready for that. So we are open to different kind of views and we try to take as much as possible, which we think is good for it. And as you said, also later in, uh, in your age, you will start to practicing full time. So we will catch up on the physical part, but we will have a little bit more intelligence when it comes to the game, um, because we're open to all of that. And the, in my eyes, the Asian players are still a little bit relying on what their coaches say and they have to do it because of that discipline, the hierarchy. So you will probably not see an Asian player not listen to their coach on court and do something totally different. Yeah. Because afterwards they will get, get their ass kicked. Butt kicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's the whole thing. As, as Europeans or as Western people, we are a little bit more open to 
everything that comes in and we take out what we think is best at that point. And of course, we also need to listen sometimes because we don't, as players, we don't see everything on court. That's why there's a coach behind, luckily. But yeah, I think uh, that is the, the main thing. So eventually the experience that we get on the highest level, competing with the Asians, being open to new things and seeing new things uh, makes it eventually that we can compete with the Asians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I've like a lot of the different Asian centers that I've trained at. Some of the players, you know, they're so good, but they just don't have that like tactical awareness or that self awareness about all those like little things yeah. that they can just change. Like not that not that hard to change, yeah. and that would improve their game a lot. And that if their coach isn't attuned to that and seeing that, then they can just keep doing the same thing. Yeah. On the other on the other hand, it's also that uh, being a badminton coach in Asia is something that is some. It's a big thing. So their honor is at stake as well. And then that combined with the cultural thing, being disciplined towards people that are higher uh, in ranking or in hierarchy, makes it that the coaches are, like my thought is the most important. So they are not open to new things. Yeah. For example, um, now you see few Asian people, or few Asian um, uh, Chinese players doing stuff with uh, Dynabands and stuff, which in Europe we already had that 10, years ago, 10 yeah. 15 years ago. So slowly they start to implement people from outside into their own mm. staff, which brings a lot of uh, extra knowledge. Yeah. So actually what is happening now is very dangerous to <laughs> European, European yeah, yeah, yeah. game. Yeah. Because, because they're starting to, to be more open. Yeah, more open and, and getting more uh, knowledge from outside. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being more efficient. Yeah. Being, yeah, and so using so. a bit more sports science and a bit more exactly. Western science into their yeah. training. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But a lot of the Asian coaches are still very traditional and they yes. kind of just teach what they learn. Whereas, you know, it's progressed a lot since then. The game's changed and everything. And yeah. Yeah, obviously each player is different as well, whereas sometimes, you know, they have such a big group to handle, they're just like, okay, everyone go do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we've gone into pretty deep, like quite a bit of detail in terms of the difference between the Asian players and European players. And because you've had the chance to compete internationally as well as train internationally and coach internationally now, yeah. if someone was listening that is thinking, oh, wow, this is all really interesting, but which training is for me? So which parts of it? So of course, everyone's got their own opinions, but if let's just say there was a, a player out there listening and they just really want to get better at badminton, just in general, as a whole thing. So not about their smash or a particular stroke, just in, in general in their performance, which parts of each, so which parts of the Asian training do you yeah. feel is the best and which part of the European part do you feel is the best? And how can someone listening know what to do so know which one to take from it okay um well as i said that asians are relying a lot on their speed and power so that kind of training as in speed uh, repetitions on a high level i would take that from the asians um, when it comes to i want to be a more smart player i would definitely go to europe and try to find a, a either danish club uh, somebody in england uh, netherlands germany uh, that doesn't matter that much they have the knowledge when it comes to tactics. If your your body is not that, as from the Asians, explosive and stuff like that, then also try to go to Europe because the efficiency in how you uh, practice is then more important. When you are, well, let's say a little bit more, you have Asian background, you have that genes that you're explosive and stuff like that, then you can go into more Asian kind of way of practicing. Uh, stamina, uh, go to Asia because your basic stamina will be built up there. Yeah, that's also in tune with like how injury prone you are as well. Like if you don't really get injured, then you can train a bit harder like the Asian exactly. style. And if you get injured a lot, then you have to be smarter with your time and yeah. how much pressure your body's under. Yeah. So it's more or less comes back to if you want to become a better per, uh, player, then it depends on what you want to, uh, where you want to increase in and physically Asia, if you can handle that. <laughs> if you cannot handle that, go to Europe because the efficiency is uh, is, is much better. Um, tactic wise, uh, European um, and speed Asia because of the the racket skill handling. It's it's so much better uh, there. They are used to it. They have that knowledge. They just do it a lot. Yeah. 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 So technically Asia as well. Te you? Technically, technically, I would go for uh, more for Asia. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
definitely. Yes. Okay. I, I took a lot of stuff uh, into my uh, own technique from a Korean coach. I had an Indonesian coach and of course here in Indo uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. They had a few things that they thought through where in Europe we tried to uh, yeah, be basic, yeah. make no mistakes. Yeah, make mistakes, yeah. 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 So for someone who can't physically actually go to those countries to train, so would a suggestion be potentially if you have your own coach, maybe find a different coach. So maybe a few sessions train with an Asian coach or Asian kind of style coach yep. and then potentially train with a different coach for, would that be something you could Yeah, you could do? I, I, I think so. If, as long as you have eventually all the knowledge within your training staff, mm -hmm. then why not? If there is a, Western coach that is more into tactics, uh, try to ask him about that, uh, watch videos, try to learn the game or look at situations and then ask that person. When it comes to technique, yeah, uh, go for Asian coach for sure. And when it comes to physical, yeah, it depends on how, how you're built. You can go both ways, but I think also at, the, at this point, if you want to have a, a very tough physical training outside of the Bama the court, anybody can do it because because it's just physically training right physical you can training. do it anyway yeah. with any kind of strength and conditioning yeah. coaching yes yeah. definitely yeah would you say as like say you're a junior coming up you should try and get exposed to kind of different countries for training to learn the different aspects um yes i, I would if you if you have the financial resources then mm -hmm. yes go and do it because what we are seeing now in europe is that france was uh, in my junior time, we had six, eight nations and six nations. They were always the, the country that would end the last. They had no level whatsoever. And now they are coming up. The last two editions, they are became uh, they became European junior champion with the team. They had, took three out of five events in the individual tournament. Now they have um, um, Christoph Popov, who became second in the world in men's singles. They are sending their people out to Asia to practice there, to get the experience to, mm -hmm. of course, also now it, uh, the, the world ranking system for juniors is different. There was none when I was a junior, now there is one. So you need to have those tournaments. But with that, you can go for training uh, camps and stuff like that. Yes, I would uh, go out and, and see what is what is there, the differences and get the experience. Uh, it's very high motivational uh, to come into a structure where people live badminton yeah. because it's a chance for them to get out of a maybe a, a not so brilliant situation at home. Badminton uh, could be something for them. So it's life changing. Mm -hmm. And that is, yeah, that, that, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Cool. I know personally from Australia that as, as juniors, a lot of kids will just get sent to Asia and I think that's like, you know, the, the pinnacle of badminton and how to be the best because they are so strong in um, badminton obviously at the world level but the first time I went to Denmark to train my mind was like blown with how different the style was and how you could actually be so efficient um, with that so yeah I definitely suggest that to smaller country um, like Australia or US or something to get exposed also to the European side and not just Asian. Yeah true well. true definitely true yeah. yeah but I think it's also good to see some kind of other uh, cultural background because in Europe, we are more or less blessed with the life that we can live. We have more or less everything. And then we go to Asia, especially for example, China, for them, it's life changing. They are out coming out of a really poor situation with their talent. They can change the change life of life. their whole family. Yeah. So uh, their, their way of living and taking chances that they are getting is so different than in Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, on, on the other hand, it's from both sides. Yeah. It's, it's good to see different kind of cultures uh, in badminton. Yeah. And seeing the sacrifices they have to make as well. Like I exactly. was just talking to some of the China players and they like literally never go home to yeah. see their parents unless somebody dies or unless like their family comes to them, which isn't. It is a very often. nice uh, documentary about um, Sang Ning? Yeah, Jane. Yeah. yeah. Where she says that literally she goes from one training camp to another training camp and within between she has a few hours or one day with their parents on the train station and then she goes further again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's how it goes. It's, which yeah. is like so different from oh, the European completely culture different. where... Completely, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't think we're, we're getting pampered. Yeah. Uh, I don't think if it. we did that in Australia or Europe, there'll be any players left. 
if exactly. that was the case. Yeah. yeah, just completely different culture. Yeah. So. Okay, Rude. So we've discussed pretty in depth about differences between Asian and European training today. So if there's anyone out there who has additional questions, are you happy to answer any questions? Sure, no problem. Sure. How would they get in contact with you? Uh, with me. Well, that's a good thing. Facebook, um, Instagram. Yeah, there it's 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 there. Uh, Facebook, uh, just search for my name. Uh, I will be there. Um, Instagram, <laughs> similar. Sure, sure. I'm not into a, uh, like social media that much anymore as a coach, uh, but um, yeah, it's still there. So uh, try to find me and, and write me a message. Yeah. So I think this podcast is really useful because hopefully you'll find that there are different things you can do in your training to help you. So just remembering that it's not always about the physical training and the speed and the power. Of course it is, but there's also a different aspect of it where you can learn to be efficient, learn to use tactics a bit more to to adapt to what your body is best doing because not everyone's body moves like Chong Wei's. Actually, no, no one's body moves like John Wayne's. Um, so it's, it's a bit hard to adapt other people's training to you if you can't actually physically do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Gronje, did you have any, any takeaways from this podcast that you think were insightful? Um, a lot of it's insightful. I don't know. I guess, yeah, just be, always being open as a player to kind of different people's point of views and their criticisms and making sure you kind of take the best from what each person can teach you. And yeah, trying to get exposed to new situations and always learning. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, from everyone here at the Malaysia Masters 2020, thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Badminton Podcast. We hope you've gotten a lot out of it and that you can use it. It's not just information, you can actually use it in your badminton career and in your life as well because we're not just about badminton. We're not talking only about how to hit jump smashes. We're talking about things you can use in your whole life. And the whole idea is that we're going to build our badminton community up to grow together and to push each other to do great things. If you want to get in contact with me or Henry, which he's not here for this podcast because he's back in Melbourne, Australia, you can contact us via our Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Our social media handle is Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R or the Badminton Podcast, no spaces. And you can also contact us via our website, www.volantware.com. And um, my handles are just Gronya Somerville for Instagram, Facebook, and yeah, YouTube, that kind of thing. And YouTube coming out soon. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, Gronya, for being the co-host when Henry's not here. And thanks again, um, Rud, for being on this podcast with us. You're welcome. All right, All right. bye. 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 <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.